become more exposed to the high winds. The gale or storm signal number eight will remain in force before noon. Kampasu has caused minor flooding in parts of Hong Kong and two men died in traffic accidents in Shek O and Tin Shui Wai. Authorities say they've received 15 reports of fallen trees, five people have sought public hospital treatment and one of them died. Earlier, people descended on supermarkets to stock up ahead of the storm. I'm so early today because we need to buy stuff for tomorrow. We need to be ready and prepare for it so that no need to go out tomorrow for our safety also. It's okay for me not to hurry and to be panicked before buying food. We're always preparing home. We have food in case of emergency and my boss is always prepared for that. (laughs) Overseas and the International Monetary Fund has warned that the recovery from the COVID pandemic is faltering with developing economies suffering more than others. It says their prospects have been hit by low vaccination rates and rising food and commodity prices. Speaking in Washington, the IMF's chief economist, Gita Kopenath, gave this overview. The outlook for low-income developing countries has taken a turn for the worse due to worsening pandemic dynamics. The downgrade also reflects more difficult near-term prospects for the advanced economy group, in part due to supply disruptions. The IMF said it expected inflation to stay high for at least the next few months as the mismatch between supply and demand persists, as seen recently in energy prices. The Democratic-controlled U.S. House of Representatives is expected to give final approval in a few hours' time to a Senate-passed bill that will temporarily raise the government's borrowing limit to $28.9 trillion U.S. trillion. That would postpone the risk of default until early December. Democrats are expected to pass the 480 billion US dollar debt limit increase despite facing another deadline within weeks to avoid both a historic debt default and temporary government shutdown. You're listening to the news on RTHK. Good morning and welcome to RTHK's Hong Kong Today. I'm Janice Wong. And I'm Samantha Butler. Coming up, at least one death is reported as severe as Typhoon Kompasu hits Hong Kong, with the number eight signal expected to stay until midday. British politicians described the government's early pandemic response as one of the worst public health failures ever. The International Monetary Fund cuts growth forecasts for the United States and China, saying the economic recovery after the pandemic is slowing and Denmark qualifies for next year's Football World Cup after beating Austria 1-0. England draw one all with Hungary. But first, at least one person has died as Hong Kong bears the brunt of Typhoon Kompasu. The number 8 signal was issued at 5.20 yesterday afternoon, resulting in people rushing home before the storm hit, while others emptied supermarket shelves for supplies. The observatory said the storm would be closest to Hong Kong early this morning, and the number 8 signal would remain in effect until around midday. As Francis Sitt reports, some coastal riverside and low-lying areas were flooded as the winds strengthened. Waves towered over the railings and crashed onto the waterfront promenade at Hong Fa Chun, with seawater overflowing and flooding the coastal walk from midnight. This coastal residential estate suffered serious flooding during Typhoon Hato in 2017, and authorities had erected flood barriers to protect the estate in advance. Some members of the public struck off the conditions and ventured out to watch the spectacle, although some of them sounded disappointed with the conditions. A man surnamed Ho told RTHK he traveled from Tu Moon to see the waves, but said they weren't as tall as he thought they would be. Even the winds weren't as strong as he experienced before, he said. Flooding also occurred in the village of Shang Ka Chun in Lei Yun Moon, which was also hard hit by Storm Hato in 2017. Villagers waded through knee-high water and were assisted by officers from the civil aid service. Some of the villagers said the situation was more serious than when Tropical Storm Lion Rock hit Hong Kong a few days earlier. Lion Rock brought a black rain warning on Friday and a construction worker died after scaffolding collapsed at a residential building in Happy Valley. 
Storm surges also led to rising water levels in the Shengmun River in Sha Tin. Areas along the river were flooded, including the Riverside Promenade, cycleways and pedestrian tunnels. Some garbage bins were damaged by the flood, and the water reached waist height in some pedestrian tunnels. Due to the number eight typhoon signal, the government has announced that classes of all-day schools are suspended, while MTR and bus companies said they will offer limited services. Meanwhile, police are investigating two fatal traffic accidents which occurred yesterday as Kompasu approached Hong Kong. At 6 p.m., after the signal eight was issued, a 31-year-old motorcyclist hit a lamppost after ramping a curb as he approached Shaco Beach. He sustained serious head injuries and was certified dead at hospital. Before the signal was raised, a 57-year-old man died in a separate road accident in Tinshu Wai at around 4 p.m. He was driving towards Yunnong Highway when he reportedly lost control of his truck and overturned. The driver was trapped, sustained head and limb injuries, and was certified dead at hospital. Francis Sid reporting. As of 1 a.m., authorities said they'd received 15 reports of fallen trees but no landslides. Five people were treated at public hospitals for injuries sustained during the typhoon. One of them died. Long queues formed at supermarkets and wet markets across the city yesterday as people rushed to stock up on supplies before the worst of Typhoon Kampasu affected the city. Vanessa Cheng has details. Supermarket staff were scrambling to keep shelves filled, but could barely keep up with shoppers' demands. People grabbed vegetables before staff could restock them, and almost all bread and cup noodles were snapped up. A woman surnamed Lee says she visited the supermarket on Monday afternoon, but everything was already gone, so she arrived a bit earlier this time around. I can still buy what I want now, but I may not be able to do so a few hours later. A domestic helper named Marie also said she's stocking up so she doesn't have to go out during the storm. We need to be ready and prepare for it, so that not need to go out for our safety also. A wet market vendor surnamed Lee, meanwhile said business was booming thanks to people panic buying things like vegetables ahead of the typhoon. Vanessa Chang. Health officials have confirmed four imported coronavirus cases involving arrivals from Indonesia, Russia and the United Kingdom. Meanwhile, the chief executive Carrie Lam says she'll soon convene experts advising the government on its COVID-19 strategy to discuss whether to give booster shots to some residents. As Wendy Wong reports, the CE again appealed to people to get vaccinated. Carrie Lam made a remark after the World Health Organization recommended that people over 60 who are vaccinated with jabs made by Sinopharm and Sinovac receive a third dose. I will soon invite the experts to have a meeting so I can listen to their views about when we should start giving booster shots to people in some special groups. Meanwhile, the CE admitted that Hong Kong's vaccine take-up rate was not good, with less than 70% of the eligible population having received the first dose. I want you people to tell me what more we could do other than uh, mandating. But even mandating may not give you the, the needed result. If people said that uh, I have medical condition, I have other problems, I just could not take a jab. She appealed to residents who have been vaccinated to encourage their friends and families to do the same. On border control, Mrs. Lam said the strict quarantine rules should continue, brushing aside concerns that the restrictions would undermine Hong Kong's status as an international financial centre. Wendy Wong. The government says it's donating 7.5 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccines it procured to COVAX, which is the global vaccine sharing program. The Secretary for Health, Sophia Chan, says the entire batch, which has yet to be delivered to the SAR, will be donated by the second quarter of next year. She said the doses were surplus to Hong Kong's requirements as there were 15 million shots of the BioNTech and Sinovac vaccines still available. It is important for those places where we have sufficient vaccine and if we have more than sufficient, then it would be most appropriate for us to donate through the WHO COVAX facility to those needy countries. University of Hong Kong epidemiologist Benjamin Cowling welcomed the government's move, saying the decision will save lives. I think it's fantastic that in Hong Kong we can donate those AstraZeneca vaccines to countries that really need them. Those vaccines are going to save lives 
in the coming weeks and the coming months. And I wonder whether the government might also consider donating some of the BioNTech and Sinovac that we have in stock right now in Hong Kong that we don't particularly need urgently. Maybe can donate them as well to save lives now and then arrange for future deliveries to replenish our stock maybe next year when we really need the vaccines. The chief executive Carrie Lam says making the housing authority pay subsidies to people who've been waiting too long for a public flat was just a funny idea she'd come up with and not a serious proposal. Violent was wearing a black T-shirt and dark-colored shorts and shoes when he fled. Detective Superintendent Sam Sin said initial investigations suggest the 48-year-old driver was stabbed in the neck in his taxi, leaving him with a two-centimeter deep wound. The driver was certified dead after he was rushed to hospital. Timmy Sung reporting. It's now 17 minutes to 7 on Hong Kong today. And uh, just a reminder that the number 8 storm signal is now in force. At 6 a.m., Kompasu was centred about 360 kilometres south of Hong Kong and is forecast to move west at about 25 kilometres per hour across the northern part of the South China Sea towards the vicinity of Hainan Island. The rain bands associated with Kompasu continue to affect the coastal coast of Guangdong. Gales are prevailing over parts of the territory with occasional storm force winds on high ground as local winds will turn to the east gradually in the morning. Places which have been sheltered before will become more exposed to the high winds. The number 8 storm signal will remain in force before noon under the influence of storm surge. The water level at Victoria Harbour and Tolo Harbour this morning was running about one metre above normal, normal high tide. In the past hour, the maximum sustained winds recorded at Tate's Kern were 119 kilometers per hour, with gusts of 147 kilometers per hour. A report by a joint committee of British MPs has described the UK government's early response to the pandemic as one of the worst national public health failures ever. It claimed that both ministers and scientists waited too long to bring in lockdowns last year at the cost of many lives. The report also alleged that this had been a deliberate ploy as the government had decided to try to build immunity in the population. Let's get more details now from our London correspondent, Peter Anderson. Good morning, Peter. Uh, Good morning to you. And as you say, this is a hard-hitting report. It has been drawn up, as you say, by MPs in the UK Parliament, two influential committees sitting on the Health and Science Committees, and they have spent months in preparing, researching and conducting interviews. More than 50 witnesses were called before them over recent weeks and months, and the result is a 151-page report called Coronavirus Lessons Learnt to Date. And the criticisms are wide-ranging. 
thing. The lockdowns were brought in too slowly, social distancing measure, measures were not brought in soon enough, and the early efforts by the UK to introduce a test and trace system were described as chaotic. Uh, the report has really pulled apart the government's response to the coronavirus. Some elements have been celebrated, the uh, delivery of vaccines, the world-leading trials into life-saving treatments, but the good news is far outweighed by the bad news. And as you say, the decisions on lockdowns and social distancing during the early weeks, one of the worst important, most important and worst public health failings, but it talks about deliberately slow and gradualistic approaches to the virus, which made the UK fare much worse, significantly worse than other countries. And it has highlighted what it describes as major deficiencies in the machinery of government. There will be many within Westminster and Whitehall this evening feeling very uncomfortable. And what's been the public response to the report? Because when you mention lockdowns, for example, they're quite controversial because people don't like having their freedoms curtailed. So what does the general public think about the findings in the report? There has been a huge interest in this and also a lot of analysis on who has commented, who hasn't commented. For example, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been very quiet and has not been seen today. It has been more junior ministers who've been put forward. But mentioning lockdowns, I think it is significant from this report, looking at how long it took the UK compared to other countries to actually impose the first lockdown. And here in the UK, what has become clear from this report is that we had had 335 deaths before we went into our first lockdown. That compares with France that had had just 149. And figures quoted in the report indicating China's first lockdown came after just 17 deaths. So this is really showing that the UK was much slower than people felt. But I suppose many would say hindsight is now a significant thing. And the government is stating that it made its decisions based on science and science alone. But what many people are saying based on this report is that why were politicians not more questioning? Why were they not more analytical in the scientific data that was presented to them? It seems that many people feel the scientists said what should happen, and the MPs went along with it without questioning or challenging. And one of the quotes that came from this report, based on that, it says that many thousands of people died in care homes here in the UK, and many thousands of those people could have been saved if earlier action had been taken. So are there any particular politicians who are being singled out in the report, and will there be any consequences from this report? Well, interestingly, the former Health Secretary Matt Hancock. He was the uh, head of the health department here in the UK for much of the pandemic, uh, but there won't be calls for him to resign because he resigned some weeks ago over another issue. So we have a health secretary in place who wasn't in that position at the start of the pandemic, and that rather leaves Boris Johnson, our MP, our Prime Minister, as being rather isolated. There are already calls for him to face the public, to be accountable for this. There are calls also for him to bring forward a, an independent and public inquiry. The government has promised an independent inquiry next year, but there are people saying that that needs to be conducted sooner rather than uh, in early 2022. And the figures are still very, very uh, poor here in the UK. We are having daily deaths today. 181 new deaths were announced today. That brings the total to 795 in the past seven days. We've had a total number of deaths of 137,000 here in the UK, and that puts us above many comparable countries in the UK, uh, in Europe. example, France, Germany and the Netherlands all recording many fewer deaths per million of population compared to the UK. And certainly the country is not out of this pandemic by any means. Uh, you mentioned the COVID deaths there. I don't know whether you know whether these deaths are from people, whether they've been vaccinated and what are the
population aged over 12 have had their first dose of the vaccine and 45.2 million people have had both doses. That equates to 78% of over 12s in the UK. Um, so that is a success, but it is interesting and it is significant that the number of people being vaccinated has fallen away considerably in recent weeks. The figures are well down and there are concerns that the uh, not enough is being done to mop up those people who so far have resisted or avoided the vaccination. Uh, there are many still, obviously, many millions who are eligible for the uh, jabs and have not yet had them. Now, earlier on Hong Kong Today, we talked about the lorry driver shortage in the UK that was causing a crisis at the petrol pumps. What's the situation like now? Things have improved in terms of getting fuel supplies to petrol stations around the UK. It improved, first of all, in the north and the Midlands. So further north in the UK, Scotland and Wales not having the same degree of problems. But they did persist for longer in the southeast particularly and in London. I have to say in the past 48, 72 hours, there has been a marked improvement. And this comes after the UK government called on services personnel, so the army, to come in and drive tankers to get the supplies through to petrol stations. What is significant, though, in the past few hours, it does seem that there are other problems in the supply chain. And we've had confirmation in the past few hours that Felixstowe, which is the UK's biggest container port, has been forced to turn away some ships from uh, elsewhere, including Asia, because of a backlog of containers caused by the HGB driver shortage. It appears that there are many thousands of empty containers just sitting at Felixstowe, which is in uh, uh, Suffolk, to the east of the country, and that is creating a huge logjam. So the problem with HGB drivers is having impacts on uh, supply to uh, UK shops, to UK customers, and there are increased fears that the Christmas trade could see stock shortages and already with still two months to go before Christmas, the concerns of supply and disruption are already growing. Thanks a lot for joining us this morning. That's our London correspondent, Peter Anderson. US equity markets have closed down with investors jittery in the run-up to third quarter earnings, although a jump in Tesla shares helped support the market. Analysts expect to see strong US profit growth for the third quarter, but investors are worried about how supply chain problems and higher prices will affect corporate America as businesses emerge from the pandemic. A number of companies have warned of issues heading into the reporting period. The S&P lost 0.3% to 4,350. The Nasdaq lost 0.1% to 14,465. And the Dow fell 0.3% to 34,378. Tesla advanced after data showed the electric vehicle maker sold more than 56,000 China-made vehicles in September, the highest since it started production in Shanghai about two years ago. The company's shares provided the biggest boost to the S&P and the Nasdaq. Shares of American Airlines rose after the company estimated a smaller than expected adjusted loss for the third quarter and signalled improved bookings for the rest of the year. MGM Resorts surged in the wake of Credit Suisse upgrade of the company's stock to outperform from neutral. On the economic front, US data showed the labour market remained tight with a record number of Americans quitting their jobs and job vacancies.
penalty when Luke Shaw's clearance caught the head of Nago. Roland Shoy converting the spot kick after 23 minutes. England equalised 14 minutes later. John Stones from close range. That was their best spell, but in the second half, they struggled to create clear-cut opportunities. It means England still have work to do and require four points from their two final qualifying matches. England remain three points clear of Poland in their group. Poland were 1-0 winners in Albania. Serbia still lead Group A by a point over Portugal, who have a game in hand. Serbia beat Azerbaijan 3-1. Portugal thrashed Luxembourg 5-0 with three goals from Cristiano Ronaldo, his 58th hat-trick for club and country. In Asian World Cup qualifying, China's struggles continue as they lost 3-2 to Saudi Arabia to remain fifth in Group B. China have one win and three losses. Only the top two qualify directly for the World Cup. Saudi Arabia's victory put them top of the group, three points ahead of Australia, who conceded a late own goal in a 2-1 loss to Japan. That ended Australia's run of 11 consecutive wins in World Cup qualifying. Iran kept their two-point advantage over South Korea at the top of Group A after the two sides played to a 1-0 draw. Lebanon moved to third after a 3-2 win over Syria. One of America's most famous sports personalities, John Gruden, has resigned as head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders. He stepped down after emails he sent before being hired in 2018 contained racist, homophobic and misogynistic comments. Gruden's emails appear to have been leaked from a workplace culture investigation by the NFL into another team, as the Las Vegas Sun's Case Kiefer explains. This was not an investigation into John Gruden. It was into the Washington football team and all the issues they've had. And through that is how they you know, found correspondence between John Gruden from when he was working at ESPN on Monday Night Football and uh, I, I believe the team president, or at least executive at that time, Bruce Allen, a close friend of his, they just exchanged many, many emails. I believe it was over the course of seven years, from 2010 to 2017. And the people that were investigating those with the NFL flagged several of them. I don't think we have an exact number with, you know, just harmful comments or, uh, you know, derogatory remarks. Gruden won the Super Bowl with Tampa Bay in 2003 and is currently in the fourth year of a 10-year, 100 million U.S. dollar contract with the Raiders. And we finish with baseball. The Houston Astros will meet the Boston Red Sox in this year's American League Championship Series. The Astros hammer the Chicago White Sox 10-1 to wrap up their division series in four games. Boston eliminated the Tampa Bay Rays with a 6-5 win in Game 4 thanks to a walk-off sacrifice fly by Kike Hernandez. Houston will host Game 1 of the Best of 7 ALCS Friday morning Hong Kong time. Over in the National League, the Milwaukee Brewers are looking to stay alive after back-to-back 3-0 defeats to the Atlanta Braves. They're playing Game 4 in Atlanta with the Brewers leading 2-0 in the fourth. The San Francisco Giants can also advance with a win today. The Giants beat the LA Dodgers 1-0 last night to take a 2-1 series lead. And that's your look at sports. Thanks, Adam. The weather now before the news at 7. The number 8 storm signal is now in force. Today is going to be cloudy with squally showers and thunderstorms. The top temperature around uh, 26 degrees. There will be occasional showers in the next couple of days, becoming cooler over the weekend and early next week. 24 degrees is the latest reading and the relative humidity, 893%. RTHK News. It's 7 o'clock. I'm Sean Kennedy. The observatory says Kampazu has intensified into a typhoon from a severe tropical storm. It also says the number 8 storm signal is likely to stay in place till before noon. Classes of all day schools are suspended, the MTR is running at reduced frequencies and bus companies will be offering only limited services. His acting senior scientific officer, Yuan Kwok Chung. The wind bank associated with Kampazu continue to affect the coast of Guangdong Gale prevailing over parts of the territory with occasional storm force wind on high ground. As wind will turn to the east gradually in the morning, places which have been sheltered before will become more exposed to the high winds. The gale or storm signal number 8 will remain in force before noon. 
As of 5am, authorities say they've received 15 reports of fallen trees and seven flood reports. They said five people had taught public hospital treatment. One person died as a result of a motorcycle accident. Earlier, people descended on supermarkets to stock up ahead of the storm. I'm so early today because we need to buy stuff for tomorrow. We need to be ready and prepare for it so that no need to go out tomorrow for our safety also. That's okay for me not to hurry and to be panicked for buying food. We're always preparing home. We have food in case of emergency and my boss is always prepared for that. <laughs> And police have said a 57-year-old man died in an accident at about 4 o'clock in Tin Shui Wai after he reportedly lost control of his truck, which overturned. He sustained head and limb injuries and was certified dead at hospital. They said they're investigating uh, another accident of a 31-year-old motorcyclist who hit a lamppost as he approached Sheko Beach. He was certified dead at hospital. That accident happened after the number 8 signal was issued. Overseas now, the International Monetary Fund has warned the recovery from the pandemic is faltering, with developing economies suffering more than others. It says their prospects have been hit by low vaccination rates and rising food and commodity prices. Here's the IMF's chief economist, Gita Gopinath. The outlook for low-income developing countries has taken a turn for the worse due to worsening pandemic dynamics. The downgrade also reflects more difficult near-term prospects for the advanced economy group, in part due to supply disruptions. The U.S. House of Representatives is expected to give final approval in a few hours to a Senate-passed bill temporarily raising the borrowing limit to $28.9 trillion. That would postpone the risk of default until early December. Democrats are expected to pass the $480 billion debt limit increase. You're listening to the news on RTHK. Thanks to Sean Kennedy in our newsroom. This is Hong Kong Today with me, Janice Wong, and Samantha Butler. Coming up in the next half hour, what Carrie Lam calls just a funny idea is creating intense discussion over whether the housing authority should compensate people who've been on the public housing queue for too long. We'll be talking to the Hong Kong Subdivided Flats Concerning Platform for their reaction to this. The chief executive praises visits to families by staff from Beijing's liaison office and the crisis in Afghanistan. People are tired because of the increase in prices. We ask the Islamic Emirate to control the prices and reach an agreement with other countries to reduce them. Can rich nations prevent economic collapse there without recognising the Taliban rulers? But first, at least one person has died as Hong Kong bears the brunt of Typhoon Kompasu. The number eight signal was issued at 5.20 yesterday afternoon, resulting in people rushing home before the storm hit, while others emptied supermarket shelves for supplies. The observatory said the storm would be closest to Hong Kong early this morning and the number eight signal would remain in effect until around midday. Here's acting senior scientific officer Yeung Kwok Chung. Severe tropical storm Kompasu has intensified into a typhoon. At 6 a.m., Kompasu was estimated to be about 360 kilometers south of Hong Kong. Kompasu is forecast to move west across the northern part of the South China Sea towards the vicinity of Highland Island. The wind bank associated with Kompasu continue to affect the coast of Guangdong. Gales are prevailing over parts of the territory with occasional storm force wind on high ground, as local wind will turn to the easterly gradually in the morning. Places which have been sheltered before will become more exposed to the high winds. The gale or storm signal number 8 will remain in force before noon. Under the influence of storm surge, the water level at Victoria Harbour and Tolo Harbour this morning was running about one metre above normal high tide. However, water levels should commence to fall during the next couple of hours. Seas will be rough with swell. Members of the public should stay away from the shoreline and not engage in water sports. With the number 8 signal in effect, classes of schools are suspended and bus and rail services are offering limited services. The storm has caused flooding in parts of Hong Kong while one man died in a traffic accident. Francis Sitt has details. 
Police said they're investigating two fatal traffic accidents. One of the accidents happened at around 6 p.m. last night, involving a 31-year-old motorcyclist who hit a lamppost as he approached Shaco Beach. Separately, a 57-year-old man died at about 4 o'clock in Tinshui Wai after he reportedly lost control of his truck. Meanwhile, in Hanfa Chun, seawater overflowed onto the waterfront promenade from midnight, flooding the coastal walk. Some members of the public ventured out to watch the spectacle despite the risk. Areas along the Sheng Moon River in Sha Tin were also flooded, with the water reaching waist height in some pedestrian tunnels. In the village of Sheng Ka Chun in Lei Yun Moon, villagers waded through knee high water. As of 5 a.m., authorities say they've received 15 reports of fallen trees and seven flood reports. They said five people sought treatment at public hospitals. The Transport Department has also announced that uh, public services such as the licensing offices at Admiralty, Cheng Shaowan, Kun Tong and Sha Tin, and uh, the Public Vehicles Unit, the Cross Boundary Unit, the Vehicle Examination Centre, the Driving Test Appointment Office, the Driving Test Centres and Written Test Centres will be suspended because of the number 8 storm signal. Before the number eight signal was raised at 5.20 p.m. yesterday, shoppers emptied shelves at supermarkets across the city, scrambling to stock up on supplies. Some told RTHK they were preparing for the worst. During the last typhoon, everything was so chaotic. This time with more advanced warning, I had more time to prepare. Last time, everything happened so suddenly, we were caught by surprise and everything was a mess. I'm so early today because we need to buy stuff for tomorrow. We need to be ready and prepare for it so that no need to go out tomorrow for our safety also. I know that uh, the people have the panic buying and then later on many people in the market. It's now seven minutes past seven on Hong Kong today. The chief executive, Carrie Lam, says making the housing authority pay subsidies to people who've been waiting too long for a flat was just a funny idea she came up with. She was referring to a pilot scheme in which the government pays monthly cash allowances to applicants who've been waiting in the queue for public housing for more than three years. Mrs. Lam had said during a television interview that the authority should be made to fork out the money. But she now says it was not a serious proposal. To discuss this further, we're now joined on the line by Lai King Kwok from the Hong Kong Subdivided Flats Concerning Platform. Good morning, Mr. Lai. Yes, good morning. Thanks for joining us on the program. Yeah. So first of all, what do you think of the uh, chief executive's idea, although it's uh, already been made clear that it's uh, not a serious proposal? Yeah, uh, I think that it's not so uh, as you said, it's funny, but because this uh, idea we are proposing uh, for a long time ago, because we are thinking that, that there should be a, a subsidy to those uh, people living in subdivided flats to ease their their uh, financial stress. So, but uh, I think to the residents, they don't concern where this money comes from. Just only they got the subsidy from the government or the or also authorities. All right. The chief executive, Carrie Lam, yesterday um, did mention that the housing authority um, can also look at ways to shorten the time for the preparation and construction of flats to uh, less than four or five years. Uh, what do you think of that? Do you agree? I think uh, we, are, we are quite uh, supporting that this should be shortened the waiting time. Uh, also, I think the, uh, shortening the construction time will be shortened to the waiting time for those friends. But, but, but the question is uh, how they can do it. I think that in the new uh, uh, political environment, it should be more easier because uh, all those people who are in the, in the uh, government structures should support the government. So it's much more easier, as, as they agree, as it's more, more easier uh, for the last uh, about, uh, past uh, several years that there's many uh, people, as they said, they were against the government. So now it should be more uh, faster time because uh, in the community there is more people supporting the government. So it's much more easier for them to to uh, to come up with a decision in the community that that they should be uh, 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 putting up more uh, public rental housing. So you believe it is possible to uh, streamline procedures and shorten the construction and time of flats? Then I think it depends on whether they can get the agreement uh, in the community and also in the uh, public authorities. And if it is possible to shorten the uh, preparation and construction time of public housing to four or five years, how much impact uh, will it have on the queue for public housing? 
I think it can uh, help in the, the, the uh, residents who are living in Sabiwagi, which is quite dangerous and also uh, uh, high rent. So it can help them if they can sort it into to four or five years. But it depends on whether it's coming true or it's just a slogan uh, for his next term of government. And, and what's the current waiting time at the moment? Sorry? What's the current waiting time for public housing at the moment? I think in, uh, it, it, it said they need to have 5.6 years, but I think normally it's, just, it's only an average. So something too may be waiting for uh, even uh, eight or uh, nine years. And then the chief executive uh, yesterday, she also suggested the use of uh, so-called modular integrated construction or MIC, uh, be ex- I mean, for it to be expanded to cover more public housing projects. Do you think that would help uh, speed up public housing construction? As far as I know, they are, u- they are already using some kind of uh, a moderate uh, building uh, just for the for the uh, rental housing. But uh, so I don't know whether it should fast and fast and wait. Yeah, I think I think the housing authority already using the fastest way to build up the uh, rental housing. But it depends on whether that they can find the land, also to make the the, the uh, agreement and, and also building up the enough supporting facilities for so- those residents in that new area. So in your view, is it a land shortage problem or is it a, that the housing authority is too slow? I think mostly it's the land problem. And also they need, if they find the land, and they also need to uh, build up some uh, uh, foundation and also some facilities. So the, the infrastructure is also an issue. And so far, how useful has the uh, government's monthly cash allowance been for people who have been queuing for public housing for more than three years? Uh, now the discipline is not in, it's not enough because it's just a uh, minimum amount. <clears throat> for uh, some people they are living with just uh, several thousand dollars, uh, but I, I think that, uh, it's still uh, helping to them, <clears throat> especially those who are living in some other unit because it's uh, very high rent. But uh, if the, the, the tenancy control is not uh, enforced uh, completely, that they all those of them will go to the uh, to the hand of the, the landlord. So the subsidy, I mean, has it been able to help alleviate their financial burden? Yes, they, it can uh, ease a, a bit, but uh, we still have the uh, rent ceiling. So those uh, subsidies may, uh, one or two years, then it will be go to the, to the uh, head of the landlord. And what is the situation like for many people who are waiting for public housing? I mean, are, are there more people moving into subdivided flats or are there more people moving out onto the streets? I think that um, most people who are living in the area cannot um, quite easy to move out because there's not enough uh, public rental housing, so they don't have many choices. All right, we have to leave it there, but thanks for joining us this morning. That's uh, Lai King Kwok from the Hong Kong Subdivided Flats Concerning Platform. It's 14 minutes past seven. You're listening to Hong Kong Today. Just some notices. The government has announced that with the number eight signal in force, all community vaccination centres uh, will remain closed. They'll resume service three hours after the cancellation of the number eight signal. DH clinics from the Department of Health, except for methadone clinics, will be operating normal hours. Uh, The health department has also said that the collection points of deep throat saliva samples for COVID testing at 10 designated clinics are also suspended. The chief executive says she's thankful that staff from Beijing's liaison office have visited families across Hong Kong. Carrie Lam says it will foster a greater sense of national identity among locals and help with the implementation of the one country, two systems principle. Priscilla Ng reports. Mrs. Lam said given the central government's comprehensive jurisdiction over the SAR, it is natural for mainland officials to make the visits with the office being Beijing's representative in Hong Kong. Of course, we practice a high degree of autonomy, but being the overall jurisdiction authority, it is, of course, their interest to have first-hand information about the Hong Kong situation. They could get it from me as a chief executive, and since there is a liaison office, they also want to hear it from a liaison office. The CE said she looked forward to receiving a large number of views and suggestions from the office, adding that they would most likely cover problems that the SAR government is already aware of, such as housing, social 
social mobility of young people and the wealth gap. She said she also wants to learn the views towards matters that are handled by Beijing and outside the ambit of the Hong Kong government, such as lifting COVID-19 travel restrictions and facilitating young people going to the mainland. So I, I would be uh, very interested to uh, learn what are those suggestions, so that I, as a chief executive, could also approach the mainland authorities, reaffirming that those suggestions are what our people want. Mrs. Lam added that the liaison office visits could remove a sense of alienation between the local people and mainland officials. She said people will develop a greater sense of national identity, which would be conducive to the effective operation of one country, two systems. Priscilla in reporting there, and uh, just a reminder that the number eight storm signal is now in force, and uh, according to the latest forecast by the observatory, at 7 a.m., Typhoon Kompasu was centred about 370 kilometres south-southwest of Hong Kong, and is forecast to move west at about 25 kilometres per hour across the northern part of the South China Sea towards the vicinity of Hainan Island. Kompasu has intensified slightly in the past few hours. It's associated rain bands continue to affect the coast of Guangdong. Gales are prevailing over parts of the territory, with occasional storm force winds on high ground. As local winds will turn to the east gradually in the morning, places which have been sheltered before will become more exposed to the high winds. Hong Kong will be donating 7.5 million doses of AstraZeneca COVID-19 jabs to the global vaccine-sharing program known as COVAX. The health chief says the decision was made because the city has more vaccines than it needs, as Timmy Sung reports. The SAR has 15 million shots of BioNTech and Sinovac vaccines available. The government says under a two-dose regime, the amount is enough to vaccine everyone here in Hong Kong. And with the supply of those two vaccines expected to be stable, it has decided to donate 7.5 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccines it procured to COVAX, the global vaccine sharing program. The batch hasn't been delivered to Hong Kong yet, and Health Secretary Sophia Chen said it will be given to COVAX by the second quarter of next year. It is important for those places where we have sufficient vaccine and if we have more than sufficient then it would be most appropriate for us to donate through the WHO COVAX facility to those needy countries. The recipients of the AstraZeneca vaccines will be 92 economies with lower income, where only around 20 percent of the population have taken the first dose. Professor Chen also said the decision to donate the jabs was made as Hong Kong's epidemic situation is relatively stable. University of Hong Kong's epidemiologist Benjamin Cowling welcomed the government's move, saying the decision will save more lives. I think it's fantastic that in Hong Kong we can donate those AstraZeneca vaccines to countries that really need them. Those vaccines are going to save lives in the coming weeks and the coming months. And I wonder whether the government might also consider donating some of the BioNTech and Sinovac that we have in stock right now in Hong Kong that we don't particularly need urgently. Maybe can donate them as well to save lives now and then arrange for future deliveries to replenish our stock maybe next year when we really need the vaccines. The World Health Organization has stressed the need for a global effort to fight the pandemic, saying no one is safe until everyone is safe. Timmy Sung reporting. For the nations that spent billions and lost countrymen fighting the Taliban in Afghanistan, it must be tempting to walk away now that the Islamists are back in charge. But at a virtual summit of G20 nations, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel warned her fellow leaders not to let Afghanistan fall apart. None of us has anything to gain if the entire monetary system in Afghanistan collapses or the financial system collapses. Then humanitarian aid can no longer be provided. Of course, it's never easy to draw the line, so to speak, but to look on as 40 million people descend into chaos because there's no electricity or financial system, that cannot and must not be the goal of the international community. The U.S. President Joe Biden and others say aid should not be given directly to the Taliban. The economy of Afghanistan is in dire straits and millions are struggling with rising costs of food and other essentials. 
People are tired because of the increase in prices. We ask the Islamic Emirate to control the prices for the sake of God and reach an agreement with other countries to reduce them. People are living very badly. I've come to buy food, but I cannot afford it, so what do we do? God has brought this day upon us. It doesn't matter. What should we do? Prices have risen sharply. In the past, a barrel of flour cost between 1,400 and 1,500 Afghanis, but now it's gone up to 2,500 Afghanis. Hizbullah Khan is a political analyst from Afghanistan. He urged the international community to provide aid to Afghans via UN agencies. I think if you provide financial assistance to the Taliban government, it means you recognize the Taliban, you recognize the brutalities of of the Taliban because providing financial assistance is just boosting the the government of the Taliban because the Taliban has completely deprived the entire Afghans from their right and they and they are not ready to provide uh, the constitutional rights uh, to Afghans so currently the best options for for the international community to provide financial assistance by the UN agencies, by the UN organization to Afghans. Uh, and that is the only options because the Taliban will not provide financial assistance. They will they will uh, make strengthen their government. They will boost their government by this aid. They will not provide this aid to the, the Afghans. So providing financial assistance to Afghans by the UN agencies is an appropriate way. That's a political analyst from Afghanistan. President Xi Jinping's special representative Wang Yi at the G20 says lessons from Afghanistan over the past two decades demonstrated that the right way to get along between countries was to respect independent choices among different civilizations. State Councillor and Foreign Minister Mr Wang made the remarks via video link and urged the nations to contribute to the peace, stability and prosperity of Afghanistan and not impose their own ideology on others. Mr Wang said China was accepted accelerating the provision of emergency assistance to Afghanistan worth 200 million yuan or 31 million US dollars in food, winter materials, vaccines and medicines. The first batch has already been delivered. The International Monetary Fund has cut growth forecasts for the United States and China and says supply chain problems and inflation pressures are impeding the world's economic recovery from the pandemic. It also warned of a so-called vaccine divide that was hurting poorer countries. Francis Sit reports. In its latest World Economic Outlook, the IMF trimmed its 2021 global growth forecast to 5.9%, down from a 6% forecast in July. It said global manufacturing is being hindered by supply chain mismatches and component shortages. The United States was taking the brunt of this, and the IMF slashed its 2021 growth forecast to 6%, down from 7% in July. It said U.S. growth could shrink further if the proposed infrastructure and social spending package doesn't go through. The IMF trimmed its China growth forecast to 8%, down from 8.1% previously. It lowered its forecast for German growth by half a percentage point to 3.1%, while Japan's growth was lowered 0.4 point to 2.4%. The IMF also warned of a dangerous divergence in economic prospects fueled by the great vaccine divide. It's that low-income countries, where 96% of the population remains unvaccinated, face lower growth for longer periods, more poverty and the prospect of de-anchored inflation expectations. China Evergrande has missed its third round of bond payments in three weeks, intensifying market fears over contagion involving other property developers. Some bondholders said they didn't receive coupon payments, totaling 148 million US dollars due after missing two other payments last month. That puts investors at risk of large losses at the end of a 30-day grace period as the troubled developer wrestles with more than 300 billion US dollars in liabilities. Hong Kong markets will likely stay closed for at least the morning during the duration 
confirmation of the typhoon signal number eight. Asian shares, meanwhile, look set for a steady start as traders weigh the impact of elevated inflation on the economic recovery and await earnings reports. Longer term treasury yields declined. The Nikkei is currently down 0.9 percent. And it's around this time of the morning when I usually tell you what's coming up in the Money Talk program after the news at 8, except our finance guru, guru, Peter Lewis, won't be joining us today because of the typhoon. Instead, we'll be running a special extended version of Hong Kong today with more news from around the world and some finance thrown in there as well. We'll have sports after this. Do you want to enjoy a hassle-free retirement? You can enjoy a lifelong guaranteed monthly income with the HKMC annuity plan. After successful application, you can receive the monthly income by the following month at the earliest. A premium discount offer is available now up to December 31st, 2021 for successful applications. Call 2512-5000 to learn more. The plan and the premium discount offer are subject to relevant terms and conditions. Adam Jung with another look at sports. Denmark are the latest team to qualify for next year's Football World Cup. A 1-0 success over Austria was enough to make it eight straight wins in Group F. In Group I, England were held to a 1-0 draw by Hungary. There was crowd trouble at Wembley Stadium as Hungarian fans clashed with police. The BBC's Ian Dennis reports. Trouble in the stands and England also found themselves in trouble as they had to come from behind. Unsavoury scenes as hungry fans fought with stewards after a racially aggravated offence. As for the hungry players, they showed a greater sense of adventure than last month's meeting in Budapest and led after a penalty when Luke Shaw's clearance caught the head of Nago, Roland Shoy, converting the spot kick after 23 minutes. England equalised 14 minutes later. John Stones from close range. That was their best spell, but in the second half, they struggled to create clear-cut opportunities. It means England still have work to do and require four points from their two final qualifying matches. Serbia lead Group A by a point over Portugal, who have a game in hand. Serbia beat Azerbaijan 3-1. Cristiano Ronaldo scored a hat-trick in Portugal's 5-0 thrashing of Luxembourg. China struggles continue as they lost 3-2 to Saudi Arabia in World Cup qualifying. China's third defeat in four games puts them fifth in Group B. Only the top two gain direct qualification. Saudi Arabia's victory put them top of the group. Japan revived their hopes by beating Australia 2-1 thanks to a late own goal. That game was watched by the BBC's Manny Jasmi. This was a massive game for the Japanese who were well off the pace in their group after three games. The top two go through automatically and they were fourth with just one win. But for the first time in quite a while, uh, they played with a bit of colour in their cheeks and took the lead after eight minutes when Aul Tanaka capitalised on a defensive mistake by Australian left back Aziz Behic to finish neatly. Uh, With 20 minutes to go, Australia were awarded a penalty for a foul on Aidan Hrustic. But while Martin Boyle was uh, impatiently waiting to take it, the video assistant referee intervened and downgraded it to a free kick on the edge of the area. But Hrustic stepped up and banged it in for an equaliser off the underside of the crossbar. Japan were denied several times by the Australian goalkeeper Matty Ryan after that before, as you say, Behe capped a miserable day with an own goal that decided the game with five minutes to go. In Group A, Iran kept their two-point advantage over South Korea at the top after the two sides played to a one all draw. Lebanon moved to third with a 3-2 win over Syria. And we're moments away from opening night of the new NHL hockey season. The champions Tampa Bay Lightning are at home to the Pittsburgh Penguins. That's followed by the Seattle Kraken making their NHL debut against the Vegas Golden Knights. The Kraken are the first Seattle hockey team to compete for the Stanley Cup since the Seattle Metropolitans won the cup in 1917 and folded in 1924. And that's your look at sports. Thanks, Adam. Just a reminder that the number eight storm signal is now in force and the hospital authority has announced that its general outpatients clinic, specialist clinics, including physiotherapy and occupational therapy. Day hospitals and psychiatric day hospitals will be closed because of the typhoon. 
Now a quick look at the weather. Strong to gale force northeasterly winds, occasionally storm force offshore and on high ground at first, becoming easterlies later. Today will be cloudy with squally showers and thunderstorms. Highs expected of around 26 degrees. Once again, the number 8 storm signal is now in place. Current right now is 26 degrees, relative humidity 92%. It's now half past seven with a new summary. Here's uh, Sean Kennedy. The observatory says Kampazu has intensified into a typhoon from a severe tropical storm and the number eight storm signal will stay in place before noon. Classes of all day schools are suspended. The MTR is running at reduced frequencies and bus companies will offer only limited services. His acting senior scientific officer from the observatory, Yuan Kwok Chung. Heavy rain bought by Kampazu may lead to flooding in low-lying areas. Members of the public should continue to take precaution against flooding. Seas will be rough with swells. Members of the public should stay away from the shoreline and not engage in water sports. Gale are prevailing over parts of the territory with occasional storm force wind on high ground. As local wind will turn to the east gradually in the morning, places which have been sheltered before will become more exposed to the high winds. The gale or storm signal number 8 will remain in force before noon. As of 6am, authorities say they've received 15 reports of fallen trees and 7 flood reports. They said 5 people sought public hospital treatment and 1 person died as the result of a motorcycle accident. Overseas now, the International Monetary Fund has warned the recovery from the pandemic is faltering, with developing economies suffering more than others. It says their prospects have been hit by low vaccination rates and rising food and commodity prices. Here's the IMF's chief economist, Gita Kopanath. The outlook for low-income developing countries has taken a turn for the worse due to worsening pandemic dynamics. The downgrade also reflects more difficult near-term prospects for the advanced economy group, in part due to supply disruptions. The British government minister responsible for overseeing the Brexit agreement has proposed replacing the arrangements made with the European Union regarding Northern Ireland with an entirely new protocol. David Frost said Britain wanted international arbitration to replace the oversight role of the EU's top court. Brussels says that only the top court can be the final interpreter of EU law. Mr Frost warned that the issue should be resolved. We have a short but real opportunity to put in place a new arrangement to defuse the political crisis that is brewing both in Northern Ireland and between us. If we can work on that, then of course other things become possible too. Other significant problems in the relationship of interest to both sides might become resolvable. Britain and the EU have repeatedly clashed over the implementation of the protocol. You're listening to the news on RTHK. Thanks to Sean Kennedy in our newsroom. This is Hong Kong Today with Janice Wong and me, Samantha Butler. Still to come in the next half hour, police hunt for a man they describe as extremely dangerous after a taxi driver is murdered in Sai Ying Pun. We look back at the life of the Soviet war veteran who raised money to battle COVID. It's like a war, in some ways even more frightening. That's why we got involved in the fight to help people recover from coronavirus. And the son of Superman and Lewis Lane comes out of the phone box as bisexual. But first, at least one person has died as Hong Kong bears the brunt of Typhoon Kampasu. The number eight signal was issued at 5.20 yesterday afternoon, resulting in people rushing home before the storm hit, while others emptied supermarket shelves for supplies. The observatory said the storm would be closest to Hong Kong early this morning, and the number eight signal would remain in effect until around midday. As Francis Sitt reports, some coastal riverside and low-lying areas were flooded as the winds strengthened. Waves towered over the railings and crashed onto the waterfront promenade at Hong Fa Chun, with seawater overflowing and flooding the coastal walk from midnight. This coastal residential estate suffered serious flooding during Typhoon Hato in 2017, and authorities had erected flood barriers to protect the estate in advance. Some members of the public struck off the conditions and ventured out to watch the spectacle, although some of them sounded disappointed with the conditions. A man surnamed Ho told RTHK he traveled from Tumun to see the waves, but said they weren't as tall as he thought they would be. 
Even the winds weren't as strong as he experienced before, he said. Flooding also occurred in the village of Shan Kachun in Leiyun Moon, which was also hard hit by Storm Hato in 2017. Villagers waded through knee-high water and were assisted by officers from the civil aid service. Some of the villagers said the situation was more serious than when Tropical Storm Lion Rock hit Hong Kong a few days earlier. Lion Rock brought a black rain warning on Friday and a construction worker died after scaffolding collapsed at a residential building in Happy Valley. Storm surges also led to rising water levels in the Xingmun River in Sha Tin. Areas along the river were flooded, including the Riverside Promenade, cycleways and pedestrian tunnels. Some garbage bins were damaged by the flood and the water reached waist height in some pedestrian tunnels. Due to the number 8 typhoon signal, the government has announced that classes of all-day schools are suspended, while MTR and bus companies said they will offer limited services. Meanwhile, police are investigating two fatal traffic accidents which occurred yesterday as Kompasu approached Hong Kong. At 6 p.m., after the Signal 8 was issued, a 31-year-old motorcyclist hit a lamppost after ramping a curb as he approached Shaco Beach. He sustained serious head injuries and was certified dead at hospital. Before the signal was raised, a 57-year-old man died in a separate road accident in Tin Shui Wai at around 4 p.m. He was driving towards Yunong Highway when he reportedly lost control of his truck and overturned. The driver was trapped, sustained head and limb injuries and was certified dead at hospital. Francis said health officials have confirmed four imported coronavirus cases involving arrivals from Indonesia, Russia and the United Kingdom. Meanwhile, the chief executive, Carrie Lam, says she'll soon convene experts advising the government on its COVID strategy to discuss whether to give booster shots to some residents. As Wendy Wong reports, the CE again appealed to people to get vaccinated. Carrie Lam made a remark after the World Health Organization recommended that people over 60 who are vaccinated with jabs made by Sinopharm and Sinovac receive a third dose. I will soon invite the experts to have a meeting so I can listen to their views about when we should start giving booster shots to people in some special groups. Meanwhile, the CE admitted that Hong Kong's vaccine take rate was not good, with less than 70 percent of the eligible population having received the first dose. I want you people to tell me what more we could do other than uh, mandating. But even mandating may not give you the, the needed result. If people said that uh, I have medical condition, I have other problems, I just could not take a jab. She appealed to residents who have been vaccinated to encourage their friends and families to do the same. On border control, Mrs. Lam said the strict quarantine rule should continue, brushing aside concerns that the restrictions would undermine Hong Kong's status as an international financial centre. Wendy Wong. The government says it's donating 7.5 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccines it procured to COVAX, the global vaccine sharing programme. The administration says there's no need for the vaccines to be delivered to Hong Kong as it already has enough Sinovac and BioNTech jabs. It added that the manufacturers of these two vaccines can be relied upon to provide a stable source of doses if there is a need. The move was welcomed by Benjamin Cowling, an epidemiologist from the University of Hong Kong. He spoke to Wang Yinting. I think it's fantastic that in Hong Kong we can donate those AstraZeneca vaccines to countries that really need them. Those vaccines are going to save lives in the coming weeks and the coming months. And I wonder whether the government might also consider donating some of the BioNTech and Sinovac that we have in stock right now in Hong Kong that we don't particularly need urgently. Maybe can donate them as well to save lives now and then arrange for future deliveries to replenish our stock maybe next year when we really need the vaccines. Do you think it's a wise move for the government to do so? Because, you know, no one has a crystal ball to see what happens in the future. Now the situation might be stable, but there might be another wave coming. What do you think about the risk assessment? Certainly there's always a risk. The fifth wave will start sooner or later. And when that happens, it is going to be difficult for us to control. But the vaccines that have just been donated are the AstraZeneca vaccines which have not been approved for use in Hong Kong anyway. And if or when we do have our fifth wave, I hope the government will act swiftly to get the case numbers under control, get the case numbers back down to zero, because I know the priority is still the zero COVID approach, where we don't want to have any 
domestic infections in Hong Kong and the government will put in place very stringent measures to keep us at zero cases. Do you think the zero infectious strategy is still a good move? Right now, in October 2021, our vaccine coverage isn't high enough for any other strategy to be feasible. Right now, we have to persist with the zero COVID strategy. But looking into the coming months and the coming year, I think if we really continue with the zero COVID strategy for a long time, it's going to start to show economic impact and, and more social impact. And I wonder whether we should look to Singapore, Australia, New Zealand for the pathway away from zero COVID after we get the vaccine coverage to a high enough level that makes it safer to relax all the COVID measures. What are the suggestions you would give to the government to boost vaccination rate? Because, you know, the government has been doing a lot in encouraging the public to do so. What else can be done? I think that the first priority is to figure out what is the timeline for Hong Kong in terms of the alternative policies and strategies. If we're going to continue zero COVID for another year or longer, then right now the vaccine coverage isn't the top priority. I would say fixing the loopholes with the on-arrival quarantines, uh, the air crew, the container terminal and so on. Those are the priorities so we can maintain zero COVID for longer periods of time. If or when we have a timeline for relaxing the COVID measures at that point, we need to look at the vaccine coverage and think of ways to get it up to a higher level. And if that's in six months time or a year's time, I'm sure it's going to involve third doses and, and maybe other things as well. Uh, maybe need to look at vaccine mandates. But right now, I don't think it's appropriate to focus too much on vaccine uptake because with zero COVID, it's not necessary to have high vaccine uptake. The most important part is the quarantines, the ports of entry, and also getting ready to have stringent domestic measures in Hong Kong, social distancing and so on, if or when our fifth wave begins. Mm -hmm. So do you think the quarantine measures are straight enough? No, we, we've seen a number of lucky escapes in recent months where there's been cases in the community that haven't transmitted. But sooner or later, one of these cases will spark our fifth wave. And I think there's a lot that can be done to tighten up the quarantine measures and the measures for people that may be at higher risk of infection from a traveller. I think we can look at the examples set in Shanghai and Guangzhou, where they've built specific facilities for on-arrival quarantine, thousands of beds in a facility at the airport so that the arriving travelers don't need to go into the city to stay in hotels that are not designed for quarantine. And the staff of those thousands of bed uh, facilities also live on site, so they're not at risk of bringing the infection back into the community. Also can think about tightening up the restrictions on air crew, container terminal workers and other groups to make it really sustainable. I think, of course, we should move away from that. But if the government really intends to persist with this for months or even years, then now is a good time to think about how to make it more secure and more sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, besides your suggestion, the government has actually announced relaxation of social distancing measure. For example, for gyms, people do not need to wear masks when doing sports. So what do you think about this? It's now about five or six months since the end of the fourth wave, one of the big advantages of the zero COVID strategy is that when cases are at zero, we can relax the domestic restrictions. We can relax social distancing. So I think this change could have been made months ago. I think there's still some other social distancing measures that could be relaxed, like the group size limits in restaurants and outdoors and so on. We don't have COVID in the community Now's a good time to relax those measures. We will need them back if or when the fifth wave begins, if or when we have community transmission. But right now, we don't need those measures. That's uh, epidemiologist Benjamin Cowling. Police are hunting for a man in connection with the murder of a taxi driver in Sai Ying Pun early yesterday morning. As Timmy Sung reports, police say the man is believed to be extremely dangerous. The police say they received a report at about 5 a.m. about a taxi driver having been attacked at the intersection of Eastern Street and Quinces Road West. The driver was rushed to hospital where he died. Assistant Western District Commander Xin Kuo Ming says they found a pool of blood in the taxi. An initial investigation suggested the 48-year-old driver was attacked with a sharp object, leaving him with a neck wound that was 7 centimeters long and about 2 centimeters deep. As for the motive, Mr. Sin said the police are investigating if they had a quarrel before the attack, or the attacker has mental health problems, or is even violence prone.
Officers seized a chopper that they believe was used in the attack. The force is hunting for a light-skinned, dark-haired man, aged between 30 and 35 and about 1.8 meters tall. They have described the suspect as very violent. Police also visited a hotel in the area as part of their investigation, trying to determine if the suspect was arrested there. Timmy Sung reporting. It's now a quarter quarter to eight on Hong Kong today. And uh, just a reminder that uh, the number eight storm signal is now in force. And according to the observatory at 7 a.m., Typhoon Kompasu was centered about 370 kilometers south-southwest of Hong Kong and is forecast to move west at about 25 kilometers per hour across the northern part of the South China Sea towards the vicinity of Hainan Island. Kompasu has intensified slightly in the past few hours. Its associated rain bands continue to affect the coast of Guangdong. Gales are prevailing over parts of the territory, with occasional storm force winds on high ground, as local winds will turn to the east gradually in the morning. Places which have been sheltered before will become more exposed to the high winds. The number 8 storm signal will remain in force before noon. President Xi Jinping has announced the launch of a 1.5 billion yuan fund to support biodiversity protection efforts in developing countries. During an opening address at the COP15 Global Biodiversity Summit in Kunming, President Xi called on other countries to also contribute to the fund, saying people around the world should join hands and contribute to high-quality development of humanity. He said China would better protect its unique natural landscapes and ecological sites by including them in the country's national park system. Environmentalists have praised the decision, but critics have pointed to the impact on biodiversity of massive infrastructure projects, as the BBC's Celia Hatton explains. China's environmental scorecard is uneven. It's the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, and decades of industrial expansion have also killed off large tracts of its once pristine ecosystem. China's famous Yangtze River is now so polluted that key species, such as the giant paddlefish and the Yangtze dolphin, are now thought to be extinct. However, Beijing is now trying to establish itself as an environmental leader, particularly for developing countries. Its latest effort, while hosting a key UN summit on biodiversity, it's announced a fund to bankroll environmental protection efforts in poor countries. China's President Xi Jinping said other countries would be welcome to contribute to the fund, which Chinese environmentalists have praised, noting that there are few other global initiatives to match it. Mr. Xi also announced a plan to expand China's national park system. Nature reserves in China have already been credited with helping to boost the numbers of Chinese pandas, leopards and wild tigers. However, in a video speech to the summit, Xi Jinping failed to address concerns over China's impact on the environment outside its borders. Those tracking Beijing's multi-billion dollar Belt and Road Initiative to establish new global trading routes say it's been disastrous for biodiversity in many countries. Huge infrastructure projects that are funded by Chinese state banks often obliterate natural areas in poor countries, analysts say, with little thought for the environmental fallout. Millions of people employed in a country's huge tourism sector will be breathing a sigh of relief in Thailand, where the government has finally announced an end to highly restrictive coronavirus quarantine requirements for fully vaccinated travellers from at least 10 low-risk nations. Prime Minister General Bhayat Chanocha announced a loosening of the rules. For those who come from the countries that are not included in our list, we will still welcome them to Thailand, but they need to undergo a quarantine period according to our rules and measures. When we ease all the restrictions, the number of infections may rise temporarily. We will have to monitor that closely and evaluate how to handle the situation if that happens. The BBC's Jonathan Head has more on the story. Thailand's been sealed off longer than most countries, um, but the pressure is very high. The economy is really suffering badly, and there are people in acute economic distress. And so they finally decided they have to start opening up. And this is not a full opening up. It's only 10 countries that will be allowed to send fully vaccinated people quarantine-free. And that's partly because Thailand has still only vaccinated about one-third of its population, fully vaccinated them, so they still feel a bit vulnerable to the possibility of new outbreaks. 
There are lots of sections of the tourist industry that are absolutely desperate and will take the chance. But there are some limitations. One is that even when tourists are allowed to arrive quarantine free on the 1st of November, they'll find that there's still a curfew in place. It starts at 10 o'clock. You've got to be off the streets by then. All the bars are closed. They've been closed for months now. Restaurants are not allowed to serve alcohol. I mean, tourists who want to come for fun may think twice, particularly because it will take a while for areas like Phuket and Koh Samui for those businesses to start back, and they look pretty desolate. The beaches are gorgeous. They're very empty, and if you love beaches, it's a great time to come. The other thing is that there are many businesses that have collapsed. Have... She was a Red Army veteran who helped Soviet forces win the Battle of Stalingrad and eventually liberate Europe from the Nazis in the Second World War. But Zenaida Koneva, who's died at the age of 99, found fame last year when she raised money for Russian doctors battling COVID. She'd been inspired by the British war veteran and fundraising phenomenon Captain Sir Tom Moore. The BBC's Richard Gulpin has more on the life of the Russian heroine. Within just two weeks of starting her fundraising campaign last May, Zineda Korneva had raised the equivalent of more than $40,000. This the result of hearing about the extraordinary success of Captain Tom Moore's fundraising campaign in Britain. The money she raised was given specifically to the families of Russian doctors who died during the coronavirus pandemic. It's like a war, in some ways even more frightening. That's why we got involved in the fight to help people recover from coronavirus. She went on to set up her own YouTube channel in which she described her experience in the Second World War. She'd been conscripted into the Soviet Armed Forces in 1942 at the age of 20, playing an important role in an air surveillance battalion. She was credited with identifying more than 200 enemy aircraft. The International Monetary Fund says the economic recovery after the coronavirus pandemic is slowing down with developing countries hit the hardest. It's blaming price rises and supply chain problems. It's slightly cut expectations for how much the global economy will grow this year to 5.9 percent. The IMF's chief economist, Gita Gopinath, talks about the risks of inflation. We have seen uh, inflation rising in many parts of the world and especially headline inflation, but also core inflation in some countries like the UK and the US. Now, we have to keep in mind that some of that inflation is what we expected in terms of rebound from inflation being too low last year. So we've seen prices come back up. We've seen the revival in commodity prices. Uh, and you're also seeing pent-up demand being released. You know, This is a very odd recovery where we have a strong mismatch between demand and supply, and that's still being sorted out. In, in, the, in these last few months. The pandemic has gone, so the problem persists, and we have additional supply side pressures, especially more recently when coming from energy prices. So all of this will feed into inflation, and we expect it will stay elevated for the next few months. But for most countries in the world, by the middle of next year, we expect to be back to more normal ranges of inflation. That's the IMF's chief economist. The creators of Superman have announced that the superhero's son will come out as bisexual in the next edition of his adventures. Jonathan Kent, like his father Clark, is trying to save the world, but from the climate crisis rather than evil villains. He's also been dealing with other contemporary issues, such as the treatment of asylum seekers and a high school shooting. Tom Taylor is the Superman writer for DC Comics behind this superhero metamorphosis. John Kent has come out as bisexual and been shown kissing his soon-to-be boyfriend, Jay Nakamura. When I was offered the gig, I had to think about it and thought about what should Superman be today. And it struck me that it would be a real missed opportunity if we replaced Clark Kent with another straight white saviour. And so this idea started to form and before I could even pitch it, Jamie Rich, who was the editor at the time, said, Tom, there's been an idea floating at DC. What do you think of this? And I said, this is great. Uh, this is what I was going to pitch. And we're on the same page before a page has even been written. The reaction has been overwhelmingly positive. I'm not going to lie, I'm quite surprised so far. Yes, there's a lot of trolls um, on Twitter. There's, there's a bit of anger, but the positive messages have far, far outweighed all of that. We have people in every language, people who are saying that they read this news today and burst into tears, people saying that they wished that this had happened when they were growing up, when they were choosing to come out, when they were making that decision, people saying that they never thought in their life that they would 
be able to see themselves in Superman, in a hero like that, literally the most powerful superhero in comics. That's uh, Tom Taylor, the Superman writer for DC Comics. Coming up next here in Hong Kong Today, more sport. As the risk of severe disease and death from COVID-19 increases with age, vaccines are highly recommended for the elderly. Common side effects are usually mild and temporary. Experts advise that those who have had flu shots before can safely receive COVID-19 vaccines. Even if you have a disease, you should get vaccinated as long as your condition is stable. Just staying home doesn't mean you're free from the risk of infection. Protect yourself. Get vaccinated early. Adam Chern with sports, and we start again with football's World Cup qualifying. Denmark are the latest team to book their place in Qatar 2022. A 1-0 success over Austria was enough to make it eight straight wins in Group F. England were held to a one all draw by Hungary in Group I. There was crowd trouble at Wembley as Hungarian fans clashed with police. More from the BBC's Ian Dennis. Trouble in the stands, and England also found themselves in trouble as they had to come from behind. Unsavoury scenes as hungry fans fought with stewards after a racially aggravated offence. As for the hungry players, they showed a greater sense of adventure than last month's meeting in Budapest and led after a penalty when Luke Shaw's clearance caught the head of Nago, Roland Shoy converting the spot kick after 23 minutes. England equalised 14 minutes later. John Stones from close range. That was their best spell, but in the second half, they struggled to create clear-cut opportunities. It means England still have work to do and require four points from their two final qualifying matches. England remain top of their group, three points clear of Poland, who were 1-0 winners in Albania. Serbia lead Group A by a point over Portugal, who have a game in hand. Serbia beat Azerbaijan 3-1. Portugal thrash Luxembourg 5-0 with three goals from Cristiano Ronaldo, his 58th hat-trick for club and country. China's struggles continue as they lost 3-2 to Saudi Arabia in World Cup qualifying. China's third defeat in four games puts them fifth in Group B. Saudi Arabia topped the group. Japan revived their hopes by beating Australia 2-1 thanks to a late own goal. Details from the BBC's Manny Jasmi. This was a massive game for the Japanese, who were well off the pace in their group after three games. The top two go through automatically, and they were fourth with just one win. But for the first time in quite a while, uh, they played with a bit of colour in their cheeks and took the lead after eight minutes when Ao Tanaka capitalised on a defensive mistake by Australian left-back Aziz Behic to finish neatly. Uh, With 20 minutes to go, Australia were awarded a penalty for a foul on Aidan Hrustic. But while Martin Boyle was uh, impatiently waiting to take it, the video assistant referee intervened and downgraded it to a free kick on the edge of the area. But Hrustic stepped up and banged it in for an equaliser off the underside of the crossbar. Japan were denied several times by the Australian goalkeeper Matty Ryan after that before, as you say, Behit capped a miserable day with an own goal that decided the game with five minutes to go. Japan trail Australia by three points and Saudi Arabia by six in the battle for the group's two automatic places for Qatar. Iran kept their two-point advantage over South Korea at the top of Group A after the two sides played to a one-all draw. Lebanon moved to third with a 3-2 win over Syria. In baseball, the Houston Astros have reached the American League Championship Series for the fifth year in a row. They hammered the Chicago White Sox 10-1 to wrap up their division series in four games and will meet the Boston Red Sox in a best-of-seven ALCS. Houston hosts Game 1 Friday morning, Hong Kong time. Over in the National League, the Milwaukee Brewers are looking to stay alive after back-to-back defeats to the Atlanta Braves. The Brewers are leading 4-2 in the fifth. The San Francisco Giants can advance with a win today. The Giants beat the LA Dodgers 1-0 last night to take a 2-1 series lead. A fifth-inning solo blast by Evan Longoria was the difference. And for now, that's all the sports. 
Thanks, Adam. Now the weather before the news summary. The number eight storm signal is currently in force as well as the thunderstorm warning. Today is going to be cloudy with squally showers and thunderstorms. The top temperature will be around 26 degrees. There will be occasional showers in the next couple of days, becoming cooler over the weekend and early next week. Right now it's 26 degrees, relative humidity 94%. The mainland and Hong Kong are connected. We all do our best with what we have to achieve a bright future together. The 8 o'clock news with Robert Kemp. The observatory says Kompasu has intensified into a typhoon from a severe tropical storm and the number 8 storm signal will stay in place before noon. Classes for all, of all day schools are suspended, the MTR is running at reduced frequencies and bus companies will be offering only limited services. Here's acting senior scientific officer Yuan Kwok Chung. Heavy rain bought by Kompasu may lead to flooding in low-lying areas. Members of the public should continue to take precaution against flooding. Seas will be rough with swells. Members of the public should stay away from the shoreline and not engage in water sports. Gale are prevailing over parts of the territory, with occasional storm force wind on high ground. As local wind will turn to the east gradually in the morning, places which have been sheltered before will become more exposed to the high winds. The gale or storm signal number 8 will remain in force before noon. As of 6am, authorities said they received 15 reports of fallen trees and 7 flood reports. They said 5 people had sought public hospital treatment and 1 died. Overseas now, the International Monetary Fund has warned the recovery from the pandemic is faltering, with developing economies suffering more than others. It says their prospects have been hit by low vaccination rates and rising food and commodity prices. Here's the IMS chief economist, Gita Gopinath. The outlook for low-income developing countries has taken a turn for the worse due to worsening pandemic dynamics. The downgrade also reflects more difficult near-term prospects for the advanced economy group, in part due to supply disruptions. You're listening to the news on RTHK. Thanks to Robert Kemp in our newsroom. This is a special Typhoon Extended Edition of Hong Kong Today with me, Janice Wong, and Samantha Butler. Coming up in the next half hour, President Xi Jinping announces the creation of a multi-million dollar fund to safeguard plants, animals, and ecosystems. The French president announces a 35 billion US dollar plan of investment aimed at giving France an edge in green technologies. But is it just a re-election bid? And feathers are ruffled in New Zealand when a bat is included in a shortlist for a bird of the year competition. Many people say that these bats actually behave more like birds than our own birds do because um, lots of our birds actually run around on the ground and live in burrows. However, our bats live in trees and fly around eating insects. But first, at least one person has died as Hong Kong bears the brunt of Typhoon Kompasu. The number eight signal was issued at 5.20 yesterday afternoon, resulting in people rushing home before the storm hit, while others emptied supermarket shelves for supplies. The observatory said the storm would be closest to Hong Kong early this morning and the number eight signal would remain in effect until around midday. As Francis Sit reports, some coastal riverside and low-lying areas were flooded as the winds strengthened. 
waves towered over the railings and crashed onto the waterfront promenade at Hong Fa Chun, with seawater overflowing and flooding the coastal walk from midnight. This coastal residential estate suffered serious flooding during Typhoon Hato in 2017, and the authorities had erected flood barriers to protect the estate in advance. Some members of the public struck off the conditions and ventured out to watch the spectacle, although some of them sounded disappointed with the conditions. A man surnamed Ho told RTHK he traveled from Tu Moon to see the waves, but said they weren't as tall as he thought they would be. Even the winds weren't as strong as he experienced before, he said. Flooding also occurred in the village of Shan Ka Chun in Lei Yun Moon, which was also hard hit by Storm Hato in 2017. Villagers waded through knee-high water and were assisted by officers from the civil aid service. Some of the villagers said the situation was more serious than when Tropical Storm Lion Rock hit Hong Kong a few days earlier. Lion Rock brought a black rain warning on Friday and a construction worker died after scaffolding collapsed at a residential building in Happy Valley. Storm surges also led to rising water levels in the Xing Moon River and Sha Tin. Areas along the river were flooded, including the Riverside Promenade, cycleways and pedestrian tunnels. Some garbage bins were damaged by the flood and the water reached waist height in some pedestrian tunnels. Due to the number 8 typhoon signal, the government has announced that classes of all-day schools are suspended, while MTR and bus companies said they will offer limited services. Meanwhile, police are investigating two fatal traffic accidents which occurred yesterday as Kompasu approached Hong Kong. At 6 p.m., after the Signal 8 was issued, a 31-year-old motorcyclist hit a lamppost after ramping a curb as he approached Shackle Beach. He sustained serious head injuries and was certified dead at hospital. Before the signal was raised, a 57-year-old man died in a separate road accident in Tin Shui Wai at around 4 p.m. He was driving towards Yunong Highway when he reportedly lost control of his truck and overturned. The driver was trapped, sustained head and limb injuries and was certified dead at hospital. Francis Sit. As of 6am, authorities had received 15 reports of fallen trees and seven flood reports. Six people have been injured and sought treatment at public hospitals. Among them, one person died. President Xi Jinping has announced the creation of a 230 million US dollar fund to help safeguard plants, animals and ecosystems in developing nations. He made the announcement at the COP15 Global Biodiversity Summit in Kunming. The host urged other countries to contribute to the fund. I hereby announce that China will take the lead by investing 1.5 billion yuan to establish the Kuming Biodiversity Fund to support biodiversity conservation in developing countries. China calls on and welcomes all parties to contribute to the fund. The international community needs to strengthen cooperation so we can build a consensus for creating a community for all life on Earth. Sean Lum is a senior lecturer in ecology and ecosystems at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. He says China has made amazing strides on biodiversity, but there's still more it can do. China, because of its economic might and, and, and its reach, global reach, they have made some amazing strides in the past few years. For example, they pushed through the inscription of the Yellow Sea potentially the most important stopover point of for migratory birds anywhere in the world. And they managed to inscribe that as a, a world heritage area. So that was an extremely, extremely important achievement that was pushed by the Chinese government. They have set aside, I think just recently announced, 30% of their habitats for, for nature and the Kunming Biodiversity Fund. On the other hand, China, because it's the manufacturing engine of the world, really is, is sourcing materials far and wide. And some of these will come from countries that have extremely valuable forests and, and wetlands and, and incredible biodiversity. So it's 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 very nuanced. It's They've made great strides, but they still have a, a big footprint. And how important is this particular gathering? Here's Sean Lum again. 
people have been talking about Glasgow and the COP26 as, as one of our last chances to sort out our climate crisis and get us on the right path. But I, I would say even more for biodiversity, this COP15 in Kunming really is, is kind of almost our last stand because if we miss this opportunity, we will see potentially catastrophic declines in the health of ecosystems. The impacts of that on human livelihoods, on climate, on basically well-being of the planet in general. I guess the backstory on this is that these targets that, that are formed what's called the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, they follow on the previous set of targets formulated in Aichi, Japan in 2010, which we've completely failed to achieve. And prior to that, the 2010 targets, which were set in 2000 with the international community, failed to meet that. So these are not, in a sense, legally binding, but they are commitments. And I guess the question is, can we keep to these commitments and how, how do we do so? The draft framework, which was just released recently, sets out a number of these different targets in sort of four broad areas with 21 specific targets. That's Sean Lum, a senior lecturer in ecology and ecosystems at Nanyan Technological University in Singapore. Staying with China news, the indebted property giant Evergrande has missed another round of bond payments, the third in three weeks. The company's debts are more than 300 billion US dollars and its failure to meet bond payments is increasing fears of a broader collapse in the Chinese property market. George Magnus is research associate at Oxford University's China Centre. He says the mainland government wants to make an example example of Evergrande and outlines what he thinks could happen next. Obviously, somebody has to pay the cost of the debt, you know, and um, it's very likely that foreign creditors uh, will lose money. It's not so clear that domestic creditors will or which ones might. Um, but there's a bit of both going on because actually the reason this is being dragged out, what seems to be dragging out, is because the government actually wants to make an example of Evergrande um, and try to teach banks and other property developers and borrowers um, that, you know, egregious risk-taking is not costless. So uh, it's, it's quite a fine line, if you see what I mean. The Lehman type of outcome is not very likely in China. It's not impossible, but it's not very likely because the government controls all of the actors, you know, banks, financial intermediaries, local governments. I mean, anybody and everybody could be included in the parceling out of Evergrande's assets and liabilities, more to the point, um, without there being sort of a broader contagion. There's not been a kind of a, a default as big as... Um, as Evergrande, to be fair. Um, but they've had a string of banks go bust over the last few years, mostly smaller banks, but ones that were kind of had high connectivity to other parts of the financial system. And so, you know, th there's a bit of a template about how this might happen. But And the idea really is obviously, first of all, you have to keep the system liquid, so nobody must be able to run out of cash. So that's the that's the job of the People's Bank of China is to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and the other is to basically get stronger companies to take over the assets and the liabilities. And I think they can probably do that and keep it kind of ring-fenced within the property sector in China. But it's not costless. People will lose money and the economy will suffer as a, as a consequence. That's uh, George Magnus, a research associate at Oxford University's China Centre. China's top anti-graft watchdog, Dog, has kicked off a two-month inspection of the country's banking and insurance regulator as part of a broader campaign to weed out corrupt officials in the financial sector. The Central, the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection is deploying teams to 25 financial institutions, including the central bank, stock exchanges, banks and asset management companies, with orders to focus on their party committees. A statement issued by the China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission, the first institution to come under scrutiny, said inspectors will be looking for any violation of political discipline, a euphemism for corruption.
It's 14 minutes past eight. And for those of you tuning in to listen to our regular Money Talk programme with Peter Lewis from 8 to 8.30, it's cancelled because of the typhoon and instead we're bringing you a special extended edition of Hong Kong Today. The International Monetary Fund says the economic recovery after the coronavirus pandemic is slowing down with developing countries hit the hardest. It's blaming price rises and supply chain problems. It's slightly cut expectations for how much the global economy will grow this year to 5.9 percent. The IMF's chief economist, Gita Gopinath, talks about the risks of inflation. We have seen uh, inflation rising in many parts of the world and especially headline inflation, but also core inflation in some countries like the UK and the US. Now, we have to keep in mind that some of that inflation is what we expected in terms of rebound from inflation being too low last year. So we've seen prices come back up. We've seen the revival in commodity prices, uh, and you're also seeing pent-up demand being released. You know, this is a very odd recovery where we have a strong mismatch between demand and supply, and that's still being sorted out in, in, the, in these last few months. The pandemic hasn't gone, so the problem persists, and we have additional supply side pressures, especially more recently when coming from energy prices. So all of this will feed into inflation, and we expect it will stay elevated for the next few months. But for most countries in the world, by the middle of next year, we expect to be back to more normal ranges of inflation. If you look at uh, the uh, inflation readings for the U.S. uh, and for the U.K., is that they have come in very strong. And you can see that also when you look at not just headline, but also core inflation. You're also seeing a strong return in demand. So, again, there are there is a demand supply mismatch that's here. And in the case of the UK, we have the sharp increase run up in natural gas prices that we have seen, which is, of course, going to feed into uh, headline inflation. Uh, so these are important concerns. But again, our view is while there are upside risks and central banks should absolutely be vigilant about what's happening with inflation, you also want to make sure that you are not uh, you know, tightening too rapidly so as to kill uh, the recovery. But again, you have to pay close attention to what's going on with inflation. Our growth projections are for the global economy to grow 5.9% this year and 4.9% next year. So we expect some slowing down to happen because of the pandemic and the supply disruptions, because of the concerns on inflation. But we are still in very healthy growth ter- uh, territory at this point in time. I, I can understand the fact that because of the supply shocks that we're seeing, We're seeing reductions in economic activity and we're seeing inflationary pressure. So the direction of that is right, but uh, it's way too premature to call this that we're heading towards stagflation. It's now coming up to 17 minutes past eight on Hong Kong today. And uh, just a reminder that the number eight storm signal is now in force. At 8 a.m., Typhoon Kompasu was centred about 380 kilometres south-southwest of Hong Kong and is forecast to move west at about 25 kilometres per hour across the northern part of the South China Sea towards the vicinity of Hainan Island. Rain bands associated with Kompasu continue to affect the coast of Guangdong. Gales are prevailing over parts of the territory, as local winds will turn to the east gradually in the morning. Places which have been sheltered before will become more exposed to the high winds. The number eight storm signal will remain in force before noon. President Emmanuel Macron has announced a 35 billion US dollar plan of investment aimed at giving France an edge in new technologies such as green energy production and biomedicine. Mr Macron said France had wasted years through poor investment choices. He wants France to develop a new smaller nuclear reactor and increase the manufacture of hydrogen. Deuxième objectif, devenir le leader de l'hydrogène vert en 2030. The second objective is to become the leader in green hydrogen by 2030. I'm saying this with total conviction. I think this is really one of the sectors where we can be the leader. This is an energy sector in which we can still do it because we have assets. Rachel Fakri is an analyst on climate and clean energy at the Research Institute, the National Natural Resources Defense Council in New York. She says making hydrogen is still very expensive, but the cost of making it can go down within this decade. Green hydrogen today is much more costly than existing gas-based hydrogen. It is up to five times more expensive. However, there is strong consensus across experts that the cost of green hydrogen will 
dropped significantly in this decade. And that is owing to two main factors. One, the technology itself, so the electrolyzers where the water is split, are projected to experience significant cost reductions in this decade, owing largely to increased deployment and economies of scale. So we still need a lot of policy interventions in this decade to get hydrogen to a place where it could actually start supporting our climate goals. France is due a presidential election in just under six months, and although Mr Macron hasn't formally declared he'll run, is this announcement a credible plan or just high-level electioneering? And elizabeth Moutier is a political analyst. The French have loved for decades, uh, possibly centuries, the whole notion of a big plan ordained from the top and uh, uh, to which sort of state money is attributed. And for some industries, it works. It certainly works for something top down like trains and, and telephones because you need the cables. Well, you need the structure, you need the infrastructure, you need the train lines. And uh, when the president says that France uh, uh, will create the next generation an effect of nuclear plants, greener, safer, smaller, uh, that is something which is indeed credible. The EU has drawn massive demand for its first sale of so-called green bonds, raising 12 billion euros, almost 108 billion Hong Kong dollars. The European Commission says it's the largest of its kind ever. It says the money will be handed out to member states to be cleaner energy, energy efficiency and other ways to achieve the EU goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. The green debt sale was the first in the EU's goal of raising 250 billion euros in sustainable debt by 2026. The British government minister responsible for overseeing the Brexit agreement has proposed replacing the arrangements made with the European Union regarding Northern Ireland with an entirely new protocol. David Frost said Britain wanted international arbitration to replace the oversight role of the EU's top court. Brussels says that only the top court can be the final interpreter of EU law. Mr Frost warned that the issue should be resolved. We have a short but real opportunity to put in place a new arrangement to diffuse the political crisis that is brewing both in Northern Ireland and between us. If we can work on that, then of course other things become possible too. Other significant problems in the relationship of interest to both sides might become resolvable. Britain and the EU have clashed over the implementation of the protocol. It aims to prevent a hard border on the island of Ireland while safeguarding the EU's single market. The U.S. House of Representatives has voted to stave off a credit default that would have sparked a recession in roiled world markets after Democrats and Republicans agreed to a stopgap fix to raise the nation's debt limit. The breakthrough puts the crisis off until at least mid-December by adding another $480 billion U.S. dollars to the borrowing cap. It came with an estimated six days to go until the country would no longer have been able to borrow money or pay off loans for the first time in its history. The result was along party lines with 290 yes votes from Democrats and none of the 206 Republican votes supporting the move. Hong Kong markets will likely stay closed for at least the morning during the duration of the typhoon signal number eight. Meanwhile, Tokyo stocks opened lower today, extending falls on Wall Street. The Nikkei was down half a percent at 28,088 in early trade, while the broader topics index slipped 0.2 percent or five points to 1,977. In the currencies, the yuan is trading at $6.45 to the US dollar, uh, 10 Hong Kong dollars 56 to the pound, 113.5 yen to the US dollar and one US dollar 15 cents to the euro. California has become the first US state to require large retailers to display toys and childcare items in gender neutral ways. The law will come into effect in 2024 and won't ban girls and boys sections, but it does demand what it called a reasonable selection of items not marketed towards a particular sex. Christina Garcia is one of two Democratic lawmakers who introduced the legislation. I was a math teacher for 13 years before I was a state legislator, and I've seen firsthand how toys help kids develop certain skills, including spatial awareness, and oftentimes those toys to build stuff, to put things together, are toys for giving to boys and not to girls. And so from the very beginning, we're creating a situation where an, an, an equal situation for our boys and girls and their learning abilities. So I'm hoping that in our ability to let kids express themselves, play with whatever they want, 
they will be able to develop additional skills in the math classrooms. But just in general, I think as kids are trying to find their identity out there, that they're able to explore and play with different things and not be limited.